good to be with you guys. Hey, what we're going to do is we're going to be finishing up chapter 2 of the book of Luke. For those of you that are just starting with us, uh, we are going through the book of Luke. It's going to take us a little while, uh, but that's good, and uh, we're going to be finishing up. The verse that you see up on the screen is the key verse for the book of Luke. It is Luke chapter 1, verse 4, and this is what was written to Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. And our goal by getting through this book is that you would have certainty in the Word of God, that you would have certainty that it truly can help you to live your life, that it is God's Word for you. And so we want to have um, this message series do that. Um, We're having some technical difficulties. There was a quilting convention here last weekend, and they destroyed the place. I'm not kidding. I guess it was quilts all over the place, but we can't get this projector to work. This one's doing crazy things. We've, we turned this one on. I have no idea. But I'm just telling you, I'm going to be here next year to see what the quilters are doing because I bet it was crazy in here, all right? Um, but anyway, so sorry about the technical difficulties, but hang with us, all right? Here we go. Hey, what we're going to do is I'm going to start off with a verse that Tim left you off with two weeks ago, which is Luke chapter 2, verse 40. So let me give you context, context, context. It is my belief that Luke himself, the good doctor, spoke to everyone in whom he writes about who is either an eyewitness or knows the story intimately about what he writes in the book of Luke. So therefore, I believe that the reason why we get so much detail of the birth of Jesus is that Luke spoke to Mary. And so what we have is we have Luke speaking to Mary, and I was just with my mom for this last week, and moms love to tell stories about their kids, and Jeff, do you remember the time, and oh my gosh, and yes, 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 all that stuff. If you can't imagine, Luke is sitting with Mary and says, okay, so they get done with the birth story, they get with him being dedicated that we looked at two weeks ago, and then honestly, I'm sure Mary had this, oh, when he first took his first step, or when he did what, I'm sure she had tons of stories, but Luke has what we call editorial rights. Does that make sense? So as he's listening to her, she's like, cute story, not important, right? Cute story, not important. Cute story, not important. And honestly, just her kind of talking about Jesus being a kid was not that important until we get to today's passage. But look what he says in Luke chapter 2, verse 40. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. That is a message that Luke got, that this child grew strong and wisdom filled him. And there was something in which Mary could see the significance of the wisdom that this child had, even as a young child. So, she, so Luke writes this down. He grew, wisdom filled him, and the favor, favor of God was upon him. Now it's interesting, so she's telling stories, telling stories, and she gets to, oh, and there's this one time He got left at the temple and was with the teachers, and Luke goes, that's the story we're going to talk about, and that's where we're picking up the story. So, Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Now, as parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, the reason why that passage is important is that the parents are doing something significant. Every year, they would go up to the feast of Passover. This was a ritual. This was a custom. This is what they did. And it sets a precedent. And in doing that, it says this is significant. There probably is one of the, no other greater event than the Passover uh, angel coming, passing over the doors of the children in the, uh, in the country of Egypt. And if there was not blood over the doorpost, then that firstborn male would die. And so it is a significant event. They would go, they would celebrate, there would be a meal and to say God protected his people with the Passover lamb. And so they would go every year. And one of the things I want to say to you young parents, do not miss the significance of what you do in front of your children when it comes to rituals or doing things. And although your kids will roll your eyes and go, oh yeah, we got to go again, they will become important milestones for them and really touchstones for them as they grow up. To this day, things that I roll my eyes on, didn't want to go to, songs will come up and take me back to that moment and how important it was to be in that place. One of the reasons we do a thing every year called Revive All is every year we went to a Revive All every year. And I will tell you, it touched my life 
honestly, starting in second grade. But those moments of remembering, of being in those places and having those moments became significant to me, and I don't know what grief I gave to my parents going. Does that make sense? Do not miss the opportunity of placing within your children's lives customs and rituals that connect them to their God, because that is what Mary and Joseph did. Verse 42, and when he was 12 years old, he went up according to custom. Now, by the way, I was a youth pastor for eight and a half years, six of those years, I was a junior high youth pastor. I love 12-year-olds. You don't trust them, but I love them, all right? 12-year-old is that crazy time where you're not a kid anymore, and you're heading towards adulthood, but you kind of don't want to go, but you kind of do. Does that make sense? It is a crazy time. 12 is nuts, all right? Never take advice from a 12-year-old. It usually doesn't go well. Uh, but, but here's 12 years old. So 12 years old, by the way, everyone's all like, oh, is this bar mitzvah and all that stuff? That tradition happened after the time of Jesus. But 12 years old, he is heading up to be with his family. Now, this is what happens. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. So let me explain to you how they first got there. The road from Nazareth, which we took to Jerusalem, was known to have on it bandits and robbers. So therefore, if this happened every year, the village would go, how many of us are going, and we're going to caravan together. Does that make, does that make sense? There is safety in numbers. So I, I'm sure there's one guy, look, we're leaving at 9 o'clock in the morning, which means they didn't leave till 2 because that's how it works, right? But the whole caravan would come with each other. So we have to understand, that is a mixture of friends, relatives, aunts, uncles, this is just a hodgepodge of people, all right? And what would happen is, is that they would all travel together. Now, some of you are not old enough, but some of you are definitely old enough to have lived on a street like I lived on. I lived on a street called Bookins, think about that one, Bookins, it was always fun to say when you were a kid, in Odessa, Texas. And on a Bookins in Odessa, Texas, everyone raised everyone's kids. That does not happen anymore. If I did something wrong, Myrtle in the fifth house down would grab me by the ear and drag me to my mother, physically lay hands on me, and my mom did not have an issue with it. The issue was the street kind of raised the kids, and the kids were all watched by the neighbors. And you had all these old ladies who had nothing to do but look for you to do something wrong and that's how, what it was like on Bookin Street, all right? Now, the thing is, is that, I mean, I mean, but today, that stuff doesn't happen. No one puts their hands on anyone's kids. No one, and really, kids can be doing stuff, and it's like, well, it's not my problem. But if it was like that in Odessa, Texas, can you imagine? I mean, this is a village of people, small village. They all know each other. All the kids kind of are hanging out with each other. Everyone's going. And so they would have caravaned with each other, Right? And honestly, it was just this idea that he's here somewhere, right? And so the concept is, is that in this process, they've gone up, they've had the festival, they're on their way back. So when they all decide to leave, Mary and Joseph, they're not being inappropriate parents. They're just assuming he's with an aunt, he's with an uncle, he's with a friend. And when we stop for food, the 12-year-old will find us. Does that make sense? That's the concept. When he gets hungry, he will find us. So look what happens. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, that went a day, they went a day's journey. But when they began to search for him among the relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. Now, so when they got there and dinner time came and Jesus doesn't show up, mom starts to panic, starts running around. No, I thought it was you. No, I thought it was you. No, I thought it was you, right? And at that moment, day's journey away, I don't think she said, well, I'm sure he's fine. Let's just wake up in the morning and go get him. I'm pretty sure her and Joseph that night headed back for Jerusalem. Does that make sense? We're going to go find our kid. So in this process, Jesus 12 years old, is hanging out. All right, we got two issues. Either we have parents that come off as that they're not watching their kid, and we have a kid who's not listening to their parents, all right? So let's get going on this. After three days, they found him in the temple, 
sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. Okay, now I want you to grasp this. Three days. Journey out, journey back, took probably one and a half, maybe two days. So for another entire day, they go searching for him. Now I want to ask you, I can point to people. Sonia, 12 years old boy, where are you going to look? A lot of sticks and rocks. All right, very good. Good job, good answer. Notice she didn't say temple, because it's not like you're thinking 12-year-old wants to hang out in the temple, right? I'm not kidding. If I ever lost a kid, you know, you're like, oh, you go to the basketball courts. You go to the skateboard park. You go, I mean, you go to different places, but I don't think many of them go, you got to go to the church. I'm sure they're just hanging out at the church. Now, one of the things is, is that in this process, they are frantically looking around Jerusalem. They are going in and out. Where could this kid be? They're going to all the places. If he stopped and looked for a second at something, they're like, let's go to that place. They are looking everywhere for this kid. Now, one of my favorite things to do is watch kids get lost in grocery stores. I think it is hilarious, all right? I, we, raise your hand if you got lost from your mom in a grocery store. That panic, isn't it the best panic in the world? Because all of a sudden, the grocery store to like a five-year-old becomes like massive, right? They cannot find anything. And you're old enough to know they're going to find mom. We're not going to let the kid out of the store. Everything's going to turn out okay. But watching the panic of the kid is awesome. So I laugh. I have a great time with it. Now, when the mom finds the kid, two things happen almost every single time. The mom grabs the kid, hugs the kid, and then what? Yells at the kid. It's awesome. It is so funny. It is this moment where the mom is there in love. I miss you. I love you. And then the rage comes up, and they begin to go, where were you? I told you to stay right here, right? It's, I love it. Anyway, so if you want to have an afternoon, bag of popcorn, sit at the grocery store, great afternoon. Now, the concept is, is can you imagine her and Joseph? I mean, they're just at every, they're just getting more anxious and more anxious. Where could he be? Someone said, have we checked the temple? Well, we've looked everywhere else. Let's go to the temple. So after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. So here's the fun part. She's angry. She's relieved, but there's all these rabbis sitting around. <laughs> she wants to punch him, but probably can't. And so we get a very, what we call, Bible moment where she is very respectful, but something tells me if the guys weren't around, Jesus would have got it. I'm just saying. All right, here we go. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Like I said, I've been around a lot of 12-year-olds. Some of them have even impressed me. But I don't think I have had any of them that could sit with what I call the big dogs. By the way, to sit with the teachers in the temple, that's the big dogs. And to have them go, wow, he's sharp. He's bright. This kid gets it. This kid's challenging us to think. He's challenges. His, his questions are great. Now, there's a whole debate on whether or not at 12 years old did Jesus have the weight of knowing that he was the Messiah and that he was the one that was going to have to die for all mankind. And by the way, we have no scripture that would say to us that, yes, he understands that. But we do understand that he had a connection to the Father, and we'll, we'll, we'll back that up in a second. And there's an understanding that he gets that he is supposed to be about what his Father is about. Now, again, all God, so I'm going to give you scripture that's going to back up. Yes, he is God in human form. But at 12 years old, could he handle the fact that he was going to die for all the world? I don't know. I don't think most 12-year-olds could. But this is Jesus, and so we're left to this unknown. But I will tell you this. He already at 12 knew that he needed to be about what his father was about. So I wanted to share with you again, Luke 2.40. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And so we see him, for whatever reason, being drawn to the things of his father. Now, he has an earthly father. And by all accounts, he comes up and does what his father does, Joseph. He becomes a carpenter or a mason, depending on who you are. And, and, and the idea is, is that Jesus, in this process, and I'll explain that at the end of the sermon, what happens there, but Jesus is understanding there's two things happening. There's this life that he's been given with this 
parents, Mary and Joseph, and there's this understanding of his father. Colossians 1, 15 through 20 says this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, and all things were created through him and for him. Again, I don't know if a 12-year-old has been given the full knowledge that he is the one that created all things. But we know that when he becomes to his fulfillment as a man, he realizes and is aware and understands he is God in flesh. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the, by the blood of his cross. We know that he becomes the fullness of God and all the fullness of God dwells in him. God in flesh, incarnation, him with us, amongst us, him loving us. But at 12, he's speaking to the teachers. Colossians 2, 9 and 10, just a little bit farther on in the book. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Folks, please do not miss the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was God in flesh, and the fullness of God bodily and was bodily in him. And so I, I just I just need you to grasp that is who Jesus is. People try to say he's a good teacher, he's a good moral person, he's a good moral direction. No, he is God. God and the fullness and the deed of God rests in him and you can trust him and he is the one who came to walk as one of us so that he would be sensitive to us and would be what he calls the good high priest who knows what it's like to be one of his followers. But at 12 years old, he's wowing the crowd. At 12 years old, He's asking questions, and they're going, wow. All right. Here we go. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. <laughs> I'm telling you, moms don't speak like that, right? Angry moms don't speak like that. I mean, she, but, but I think in front of the other crowd, it's like... How many of you had your mom like, right? And if you acted like you didn't see your mom making the motions, you could keep like not going over there because I see your mom like, I don't know, I don't know if I go. Because you know what happens if you go over there, right? And you get the gritted teeth mom talk. That's the best stuff ever. Now, you come on, admit it. If you knew what you knew as an adult and you went back as a kid and you watched your mom do half the stuff you did, you would have laughed anyway. All right, here we go. So she goes, um, son, why have you treated us so? By the way, he had no evil intent. There was no intent upon him to not go with his family. He got caught up in being in his father's house. I, I mean, I don't believe there was a, oh, my family's leaving, forget them. I don't think there was any evil intent. When Jody and I first got married, I used to get in trouble all the time. We had one car, and I would forget her. I know that sounds horrible. I, please, you can, you, can, you can feel bad for her. She would teach. Her class would be done at three. I'd be at the office. I'd be working on something. I'd be so excited about what I'm working on. I would lose all track of time. And then about four, my brain would come back, Right? And I would drive and see her walking with her book bag up the road. And that was not a good night. <laughs> Actually, that was not a bunch of good nights. But I'm just telling you, I had no evil intent. I would just get focused on what I'm doing and forget that I was supposed to pick her up. 
now I think, I wish I had an iPhone back then. It had been so much better. Like, the thing would have reminded me. But I didn't, so I forgot her a lot. But in his concept, I, I, I think he was just so intent on what he's doing, there was not an evil intent on his part. And verse 49, and he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? I want you to understand what he's saying. He's not saying, why were you looking for me? Like, why would you care about me or anything else? This is what he's saying. Why would you look any place else? In his mind, it is actually completely, this is the only place you could have, like, what he's saying to them is, mom, dad, why did you look all over Jerusalem? Why would you go any place else? This is the only place you should have expected to have found me. That's what he's saying. He's not being disrespectful. He's not being flippant. It's kind of like, this is what I'm here for. Why would I not be here? Why would I not be in this place? And I want you to grasp that. That at 12 years old, he is beginning to understand that for him, this is it. Yes, he's going to go on and learn the family business and probably be uh, a mason and do the things he's got to do there. But the fact is, is that he is getting, I am about my father and I am about what my father is about. Now watch this. This is an interesting phrase. And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And I want you to understand that when he said these phrases, you know the movies where they have the flashback where you go through the tunnel and you go back? I believe that when he said, why would I not be in my father's house? I believe that in their mind, they go back to this point of, yeah, that's what the angel said. And yeah, that's what this angel said. And they're coming back. Because you have to understand something. When you really look at what happens in Scripture, God says very little to Mary and Joseph about raising Jesus. Truly. We get an angel that visits Mary. We get an angel that visits Joseph. They are brought to Bethlehem by, again, this whole whole counting, this census. They know that these, honestly, they know that these shepherds were told to come because angels told them to come look for the child. And they know that wise men come to give gifts to the baby. One other angel story happens, and that's when Joseph is told to get his baby out of the area because Herod was looking to take his life. Other than that, by Scripture, pretty much, that's all God says. He just kind of gives Jesus in the hands of Joseph and Mary, and they raise him. And at 12 years old, no, they weren't expecting him to be in the temple. No, they weren't expecting him to be about his father's business. They were expecting him to be 12. And when he says, why would I not be about my father's house? I think in that moment, they're going, they're, they're trying to understand that this stuff that was said about him, that he would be the one who would bring peace to Israel, that he would be the one that would come and change mankind. All of these things well up. And I think you have to understand, we look at it from hindsight. We have the scriptures, we read it. But folks, they're just living. They're making him clean up his room and feed his pets. And you know what I'm saying? They're just living. And it's got to be weird to think that the God of the universe is your son. And I think a lot of them probably just put that out of their mind. He's just Jesus to them. I mean, have you ever met a star? Trust me, there's a parent that goes, they're really not that big of a deal. Does that make sense? I'm seriously, Brad Pitt's mom, like, he's Brad, right? And Mary's just like, I see him every day. And so when he says these things, I think it shook them. Because it says they did not understand this. In Luke 1022, it says this. This is what Jesus says. Look at the intimacy that Jesus speaks about his heavenly father. All things have been handed over to me by my father. And no one knows who the son is except the father or who the father is except the son and anyone to, and to anyone whom the son chooses to reveal him. And I think it was very difficult for Mary and Joseph to even... Gra- Can you even start to fathom this, right? They're just raising him. By the way, Joseph, significant role in Jesus' life. 
Mary gets all the good press. I'm just telling you, right? All my Catholic friends tell me, Mary gets all the good stuff, right? I'm going to tell you right now, by tradition and by history, Mary would not have taught Jesus the Torah. That would have been Joseph. Mary would not have taught Jesus what it meant to follow God. That would have been Joseph. Joseph was the one that would have given him a thirst for God and his word. Joseph would have took him through the book of Deuteronomy. Joseph would have took him through the book of Exodus. Joseph would have explained to him how come the laws were so important. And this thirst for knowledge that ends up with him at 12 years old sitting with these guys came because Joseph would sit with him and read him scripture as he got up and as he walked along and as he did things. That's where it comes from. And I need you to see that what we have in the story is just, as Mary told all these stories about Jesus, Luke hones in on this story because it's the first time that Jesus acknowledges that his Father, Heavenly Father, is what his business is about. Therefore, that's why Luke puts it in his book. Verse 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. I just was with my father. I love my dad. My dad has a sixth grade uh, reading education. Uh, he stopped. He pretty much, um, he's an avid reader now. Uh, but when I was growing up, he honestly did, stopped at sixth grade because he was a really good football player and in Odessa, Texas. You don't take classes. People take classes for you after sixth grade. My dad stopped learning. And it didn't take long for me when it came to my spiritual life to realize that when I started going to Bible college and everything else, I actually knew more than my father did at, probably at high school when it came to spiritual things. And yet, you know what God told me that I was supposed to be is submissive to my father. Knowledge does not mean that you're not submissive. And I'm sure as Jesus grew in his knowledge of God and knowledge of what he had him for, there's times I'm sure he was with, when he was with his mother, he'd be like, yeah, mom, okay. And just was submissive. Does that make sense? And dad would say something, he'd be like, okay, dad, all right. Because there's a message of submission and honoring of his father and mother. He is God in the flesh, and yet he was submissive to Mary and to Joseph. It's believed that Joseph dies probably somewhere in uh, Jesus' later uh, early teens or early 20s, and Jesus then becomes the head of the home, takes over the family business. That's the tradition that's out there. But it's this idea of him being submissive, and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Now, why is that the second time we've heard that phrase? Because Luke has talked to Mary. She's like, you know, these are the things that I hold on to, the time that we were in Jerusalem and we lost him for three days, right? Again, Luke chapter 2, verse 40, and the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is how Luke bookends this section. Verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Both are wrapped in this concept of wisdom. One of the things we realize about Jesus is, yes, he was a teacher, and yes, he loved, and yes, he did miracles. But can I tell you, one of the things that blows us away when we look at Scripture is how wise he was with those he was with. Sometimes Jesus' most wise thing is he doesn't say anything at all. Woman caught in adultery when he just writes in the, in the dirt. There was wisdom that was being poured into him, and he found favor with God and man, meaning everyone who was around him enjoyed his presence. He was comfortable in his own skin. He was able to be with prostitutes, tax collectors, lawyers, theologians, Samaritans, Pharisees, kings, and knew exactly who he was and what he was about. I want to share something with you from a little bit of last week's message, if you were able to be at the park with us, and a little bit of today's message. I am feeling a really 
strong pull of a lot of people who feel as if they have nothing to offer the kingdom of God. We have become a society where the paid professionals do the work. You hire the pastors, the pastors run the church, the pastors are the ones that go win people to Christ, and you and, and that's their, that's their professional job. And a lot of people feel like that all they're to do is sit in the crowd and pay for ministry to happen. But they don't truly believe that ministry happens through them. And what's interesting is, as I talked about last week, David, who was to be the king of Israel, his training was to be a shepherd with sheep. And the reason why he was able to take down Goliath is because every day he used a sling. I want you to understand something. God has gifted you. Listen to me. God has gifted you. And there is no gift that God has given you that he cannot use for his kingdom. And God did not need, listen to me, God did not need Saul with all his armor. He needed a a boy who had a heart to do what God's will is. And I'm, you're saying, I, I can't imagine what, what, how God could use me. Tell you what you do. Sign up for Compassion Network. Get one of the I Am Willing boxes. Fill that out and find out that something that you just do naturally, that you just do because you like it or you're good at it, you will not believe how many times that will be used for the kingdom of God. I hate math. Hate it. You can have it. Okay? It drove me nuts. I would study for hours to get Ds. Does that make sense? I hate math. I don't get the concept of it. I I understand there's numbers. I got that point because I watch football. But I'm telling you, I hate math. And yet some of you had a friend of mine who had never cracked his book in algebra, never cracked his book in geometry, never cracked his book, and just passed all the tests, and I hated him. Because it was like, are you kidding me? Right? I would kill that. No, he could just do it. And some of you, I look at something that you're able to do, and it's nothing for you. And it's just like, ah, how do you do that? And some of you look at something that I do, and you're like, how does he do that? I'm telling you. I'm telling you. God wants to use your gifting. And you're going, well, what I have is small, and what I have doesn't make a difference. It does make a difference. We need people with their giftings, and yes, even their love of numbers to help us, right? Praise God for Steve Flynn. But I'm telling you, we need you. We need your giftings. The the little dividers that we have in our children's room were made by our ladies who, by the way, sewed a straight line. They were like, Jeff, it was just sewing a straight line. Yeah, but guess what? I can't sew a straight line. So guess what? That's a gift. And there are people, and, and some of you, okay. I'll give you an example. How many of you send thank you note cards or send note cards? God bless you. I have never once in my life had a thought, oh, I should send them a note card. I've had people tell him, Jeff, you really should send them a note card. And if you ever get a card from me, believe somebody told me to send you a note card. Trust me. But when, how have you been blessed by someone who sent you a note card, right? You've been blessed. It's those words, right moment, right time, and that person to them, that was nothing. That's just, they just sit down a quick note. Never in my world. And I just want you to understand that something is sending a note or sending an encouragement, or, or, or do, it's so powerful. So let me end with this story. It's one of my favorite stories, and it's true because I was there. I'm an intern at Central Christian Church in Mesa, Arizona. There's a church of about 4,000 people, huge staff. I'm an intern. I am a peon. I am a no one. The day I arrived in town, they're having an all-staff party in one of the elders' houses. It was going to be a luncheon. We're all going to just kind of hang out. It had no real purpose. And then I was one of the interns that was just going to be introduced. So we're there. This is Jeff. He's from California. Hey, how you doing? And literally, so many interns, they were just like, hey, how you doing? I mean, literally, I'm just, hi. You know, and some people were nice to me and came and talked to me. But other than that, I'm just there. They're all having a great time, and they're all talking. I notice out of the corner of my eye that there is a couch, and there is a huddle of women around this couch. And so I do what every guy does who's bored. I got my, my celery stick and my carrot stick, right? And I just kind of walk on over, and I'm standing there, and I'm watching. And I, there, there's a lady. And there's a lady there, and she has a little red jar about this big. 
And she's talking, and by the way, whoever was sitting in a little love seat, sitting next to her, she was fully in with that person. I mean, they were like locked being gays thing, right? And I'm watching, and, but there's a crowd of women watching the locked being gays thing. And I figured out what was going on because I'm observant this way. What she was doing is that she would have the lady sit down, she would take off her wedding ring, she would take out her little jar of jewelry cleaner, she would drop her jewelry in there, and then she would put the lid on, and then she would just ask about her marriage and how they were doing, and she would just talk with them and talk about the blessing of marriage and how wonderful that was, and I don't know how, what the timer was supposed to be, I don't know if it's 30 seconds or 90 seconds or whatever, and then bing, she would take it out, and she's got a little brush, and again, she's like 80 or 90, and she just scrubbed the little brush, and she then, and she'd dry it off in a little cloth, and then she would put it in her hand, and then she would bless that lady's marriage, bless her, pray for her, that lady would get up, and then the next lady would sit down. And she did that the entire time. And I'm telling you what, these ladies walked away beaming and excited, looking at their shiny ring because someone had said, you're too busy and you got baby food on that ring. Come here, baby, let me take care of you. And she would pamper and pray for them. And, that, and I talk, so I talked to the guy who was my boss, and I said, what's the lady in the jewelry? She goes, that's what she does everywhere. She will stop ladies in the grocery store and say, have you had your ring clean? And she goes, believe or non-believer, she takes the ring off, starts praying for him and blessing the garbage out of him. And she has your ring. Where are you going? You know what I'm saying? You're there. You're, you're, you're in. And she would just pray for him and everything else. And then she, and people, and she goes, she does that everywhere. She's been doing it for years. Do you see that? Can I tell you this? That lady Cleaning women's wedding rings probably has done more for the kingdom than any pastor standing on the stage. Because she was looking in their eyes and saying how important their marriage was and having them remember their vows and remember why they got into this whole thing in the first place and remember that it is hard work and it is tough and someone took time to recognize that and these ladies walked away blessed. I'm telling you, there are little things that we can do that will do more for the kingdom than you can imagine. The team is going to Cuba just for these families to get away from whatever they've been doing and have a good excuse to get away and not think about it. Just that alone is going to be great. But then to be loved on by this team takes it to a different level. And you're like, what did you do? I played soccer for five hours, right, with a bunch of kids. But that'll be the best thing you could do. Why? Because mom and dad didn't have to worry about the kids for five hours. And they were in good hands being loved on. Folks, I'm telling you, whatever gifting you think you do or do not have, hand it over to God because God is looking for a willing heart that will be used for him and by him. All right. I just want to say this to you. Jesus knew that he was to be about his father's work and to be about his father's house. Folks, may we be say the same thing. When people find us, may we say, no, I do what matters to my father. And by the way, don't lose your kids. All right, here we go. Father, We come to you and we thank you. We thank you for the blessing that you are to us as you share the fact that you just want us to be us. And in being us, you want to use what you've done with that, Father, to bless other people. So, Father, would you just use this time, would you do this time of worship to your glory? Would you use this service to your glory? Father, I just want to thank you for this church. I want to ask that you be with Tim and his family as they go on vacation. Would you just restore and replenish them in this week? God, would you just be with the, with the Cuba trip? Would you be with all these different elements? And Father, would you do so to your glory? I thank you for your, your word. I thank you for the fact that we get to take communion and share that with each other. Father, you are an amazing God, and I love you very much. And I pray these things in your name. Amen.